Good morning and welcome to New Hanover County Schools The Morning Show. I'm Dylan Grace. And I'm Hannah Bolick. This is the week of October 27th through November 2nd. This is the week of Halloween and we have all types of interesting facts and outstanding segments celebrating this enjoyable yet spooky day. Today's show features special Halloween editions of The List and The Buzz. Each one is sure to delight. And in our archaeology news segment, we travel to the tomb of mummies for a real-life story as eerie as any ghost tale. We will also cover some important Halloween safety tips that both the young and old should keep in mind when out celebrating and trick-or-treating. It's going to be a fun show celebrating one of our most popular holidays, but for now, let's check in with our news anchor, Jada Ozugo. She is standing by with our first look at your school news headlines. Good morning, Jada. Good morning, Dylan and Hannah, and welcome everyone to your school news here on The Morning Show. Topping the headlines this week, Board of Education holds October meeting, Holly Tree students learn about nuclear energy, and Blair Elementary Skypes to school in India. I will have all of those stories and more coming up later in the show. Thanks, Jada. We get things going today with a staple here on The Morning Show with a segment we call This Week in History. Our Grand Master of Historical Knowledge has all the headlines from past times in This Week in History brought to you by Kidsville News. Welcome to This Week in History. I'm your historical host, Samantha Klein, covering all the colorful and amazing events that have left their mark on history's timeline. This is the week of October 27th through November 2nd. October 27th, 1994. The U.S. Justice Department announces that the U.S. prison population has topped 1 million for the first time in American history. The figure, 1 million, 12,851 men and women were in state and federal prisons, did not even include local prisons, where an estimated 500,000 prisoners were held, usually for short periods. The recent increase due to tougher sentencing laws made the United States second only to Russia in the world for incarceration rates. October 28, 1962. The Cuban Missile Crisis comes to a close as Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev agrees to remove Russian missiles from Cuba in exchange for a promise from the United States to respect Cuba's territorial sovereignty. October 29, 1929. Black Tuesday hits Wall Street as investors trade over 19 million shares on the New York Stock Exchange in a single day. Billions of dollars were lost, wiping out thousands of investors, and stock ticketers ran hours behind because the machinery could not handle the tremendous volume of trading. In the aftermath of Black Tuesday, America and the rest of the industrialized world spiraled downward into the Great Depression. October 30, 1970. Oakland, California enacts a law against opium, morphine, and cocaine. The new regulations allowed only doctors to prescribe these drugs, which, until then, have been legal for cures or pain relief. Reflecting a general trend at the time, Oakland was only one of the jurisdictions across the country that began to pass criminal laws against the use of mind-altering substances. October 31st. 1917. Harry Houdini, the most elaborate, celebrated magician and escape artist of the 20th century, dies in, Det in a Detroit hospital. Twelve days before, Houdini had been talking to a group of students after a lecture in Montreal when he commented on the strength of his stomach muscles and their ability to withstand hard blows. Suddenly, one of the students punched Houdini twice in the stomach. The magician hadn't had time to repair to prepare and the blows ruptured his appendix. Finally, your weekend history tidbits. 
November 1st, 1930, President Herbert Hoover turns a telegraphic golden tea key in the White House to mark the opening of the 5,160-foot-long Detroit-Windsor Tunnel between the U.S. city of Detroit, Michigan and the Canadian city of Windsor, Ontario. The tunnel opened to regular traffic on November 3rd. November 2nd, 1902, engineer Andrew Riker delivers the first four-cylinder gas-powered locomo locomobile, a $4,000 12-horsepower Model C, to a buyer in New York City. The locomobile com company had been known for building heavy, powerful steam cars, but by the turn of the century, it was clear that the future of the automobile, and thus of the locomobile, lie, lay in the internal combustion machine engine. That's This Week in History, your ultimate source for those key moments in time. I'm Samantha Klein. Thanks for stopping by. This Week in History is brought to you by Kidsville News, a fun and effective learning resource for children, teachers, and parents. It features school news, information, and local community events while promoting literacy and the development of good reading habits, character traits, and study skills in young children. And Kidsville News is always free. Copies are delivered every month to every elementary school in the New Hanover County school system. And join us again next time for another journey through time as we explore the fun, fascinating, entertaining, and educational facts that make up this week in history. Now don't go away. We'll be right back. Edgar Allan Poe led a troubled life plagued by poverty and the loss of the people he loved. Despite his problems, Poe produced a large body of work including short stories, essays, and poems. He died in Baltimore at the age of 40, but his stories and poems live on, read by millions of readers in America and around the world. This background in literature has been brought to you by New Hanover County Schools on the Learning Network of the Cape Fear. Welcome back to The Morning Show. I'm Dylan Grace. And I'm Hannah Bolick. We continue today's show with a little background information on Halloween. Like most holidays, Halloween traditions have developed from a wide range of historic events and customs. Halloween is a shortening of All Hallows Evening, which is the title given because it's the day before All Saints Day. In addition, its origins date back to the Celtic festival known as Samhain. The festival was a celebration of the end of the harvest season. However, October 31st was also believed to be a day when the boundaries between the living and dead overlapped. The practice of mumming, where food and drink were left out as offering to placate those from beyond, eventually evolved to what we know as trick-or-treating. Over time, many traditional traditions from Samhain and All Saints Day melded into what we know as Halloween. Bonfires, bobbing for apples, and costume wearing all spawned from these ancient traditions. In modern-day America, the day has grown from one celebrated mostly by children to one in which many adults also partake in, including costume wearing. Here are a couple of fun Halloween facts. Believe it or not, some people actually have a recognized fear of Halloween, and it even has a name, Samhainophobia. So now you know what to call it when you hide behind the couch with the lights off when kids come trick-or-treating and you've forgotten to buy treats. Approximately Four billion dollars is spent each year on costumes, decorations, and parties. Candy consumption alone makes up two billion dollars. The candy industry makes a quarter of the year's revenue during Halloween alone. We have plenty more for you during this Halloween pack show, but for now let's send it over to the news desk for our first look at your school news with Jada Azugal. Good morning, Jada. Good morning and welcome to your school news on the morning show. I'm Jada Ozugal. The Board of Education held their monthly, monthly meeting on October 14th at the BOE, Center on South 15th Street. The agenda included recognitions of achievement and a lengthy call to the audience presentation of design, schematics for the new Northeast Elementary School and more. Our top story this week is the board notes and here with all the details is YSN reporter Dylan Grace. The October Board of Education meeting, which started this month at 6.30 rather than 5.30, included a number of recognitions, the introduction of some policy changes on first reading, 
and under new business the renewal of some sole source contracts. Here are the board notes. Under recognition of achievement, the board recognized Alexandra Sider for her winning of the Professional Educators of North Carolina 2014 Young Artist Competition. A New Hanover High student for a special Eagle Scout project donation to the Wildcat Marching Band, a Pine Valley teacher for her achievement of Skype Master Teacher, and several schools for winning the Alliance for Healthier Generations 2014 National Healthy Schools Award. Under information, policies for first reading were presented. They were policy 4100 safety, policy 4110 disaster plans, policy 4250 traffic and parking controls, policy 6110 employment status, policy 6121 employment of administrators and supervisory personnel, policy 6210 assignment and transfer of staff, policy 6236 employment of teachers without career status, and policy 6355, evaluation of license. Policy 6236 and 6121 were voted on that evening. Dr. LaShawn Smith um, and AIG and lead teacher like Sarah Gubitz so presented a much discussed overview of the middle school so AIG I curriculum. School Deputy amazing. Superintendent Dr. Rick Holliday gave a comprehensive oh, report on health precautions <laughs> the school system is undertaking in light of the cold and flu season. Also in regard to being proactive and working to ensure our students are, and schools are healthy throughout. The director of the New Hanover County Elections Board came to the October board meeting. He presented a plan to move all poll stations into public buildings by the next national election. The board directed the calendar committee to address the issue by making election days a non-student school day so that all school buildings could be used as polling sites. Under new business, the school bus GPS system was approved. Consideration of agreement for the purchase and sale of real property was approved. And schematic designs for the new Northeast Elementary School was reviewed and approved. A number of sole source technology contracts were renewed. They included Staff Development for Educators, Voyager Sopras Learning, Joy Lads, and Little Bits Electronics. Under instruction, Compass Learning Software, Wireless Generation Software, North Carolina Pre-K Contracts, and the Gifted Advisory Council Bylaws and Council Membership were all approved. The next regular Board of Education meeting will be Wednesday, November 12th and returns to regular 5.30 p.m. start time at the Board of Education Center, 1805 South 13th Street. As always, if you cannot attend the meeting in person, you can tune in for the rebroadcast Wednesday nights at 8 p.m., Friday mornings at 8 a.m., and Sundays at 1 p.m. Board meetings can also be watched online at www.nhcs.net under the School Board tab. That's your board notes for October. Back to you. Students at Holly Tree Elementary got a lesson in nuclear power from members of the GE Hitachi Nuclear Energy Chapter of the North American Young Generation in Nuclear. Through skits and graphics, the engineers demonstrated the clean, safe way that nuclear power produces electricity. Students learned that nuclear energy does not burn any fuel like coal, so there are no pollutants released into the air. With a clever demonstration using Coca-Cola and Mento, students learned how nuclear power plants use fission to make electricity. And we're a part of the North American Young Generation in Nuclear. We came here to talk to the kids about nuclear energy and the benefits to the community and to also introduce their, our annual drawing contest. Following the lesson in nuclear power, students learn about coloring contest. The program is a district-wide event for students on the theme, Nuclear Energy for Clean Skies. The library of each winner's school will receive a collection of books and reference materials on nuclear science and technology. The top three finalists will each receive Young Generations t-shirt, a science kit, and award certific certificate and honorary membership in the Young Generation Nuclear Society. 
Taylor Spear, math teacher at Isaac Bear Early College High School, received this year's Outstanding Secondary Mathematics Teacher Award from the North Carolina Council of Teachers of Mathematics. In 2014, principals of North Carolina schools were encouraged to nominate the teacher they believe does the most effective job teaching mathemati mathematics in their school. From those nominated, each local education agency selected one teacher to represent the best in mathematics teaching from the entire system. Mr. Spear will receive one year's membership in the Council of Mathematics, recognition at their annual meeting in Greensboro, and a special memento of the occasion. For all the latest on New Hanover County Schools, join us weekdays at 5.30 p.m. here on Time Warner Cable Channel 5 and Charter Cable Channel 191 for your school news, a complete half hour of all the latest news and information from the New Hanover County Schools. Now back to our hosts. Thanks, Jada. This week we have a special segment of of the list where our host, Jamie Stauffert, shows us the top 10 Halloween symbols. The list is our fun segment that is both informative and entertaining. From animals to food to entertainment and education, each episode counts down 10 items that are top in their category. You at home can follow along and see if you agree or disagree with the list. Welcome to this week's edition of The List. I'm your host, Jamie Stalford. Well, it's officially everyone's favorite time of year, autumn, which means that Halloween is approaching soon. Here's a fun fact. In the 1950s, trick-or-treating became all the rage in the United States, but it actually started out in Great Britain and Ireland as something called souling. As far back as the Middle Ages, poor children would go door to door collecting handouts in return for their prayers for the dead. This month, in honor of Halloween, we're going to explore some of the popular symbols we associate with Halloween and what they really have to do with the holiday. Now don't get too excited, because I don't have any candy, but get ready to dive into the top 10 Halloween symbols. We start our list off this week with number 10, corn husks and stalks of wheat. The significance of corn husks and stalks of wheat is pretty straightforward. Halloween comes in the autumn. The traditional Celtic festival of Samhain is celebrated at the end of summer and the end of the harvest, this symbol is meant to represent the end of the harvest and the beginning of winter. Corn and wheat are symbols of agricultural change and the change of the seasons. Nothing very spooky about it, unless it's a decoration on your haunted hayride. Coming in at number 9 are the colors orange and black. Similar to number 10, the colors orange and black are most likely further representations of the time of year, rather than any Halloween lore or mythology. The color orange likely represents represents autumn, when the leaves change from green and orange pumpkins are ripe for the picking. As mentioned earlier, the Celtic festival of Semain marked the transition between light days and dark days, so the black likely represents those dark days of winter, when there are fewer daylight hours to attend to the fields and crops. The number eight spot goes to spiders. Of course spiders are spooky. They scare just about everyone, including me. Go to a Halloween party and you're sure to see fake spiderwebs spread all over the place. It is significant that spiders weave webs, which has been associated with the passing of time, progress, and fate. Also, spiders like dusty, dark places. So in an abandoned house, a favorite visiting spot on Halloween, you're bound to find plenty of spiders and spider webs. You hear that, kids? Stay away from dusty, dark places. At number seven this week are bats. Bats are nocturnal, so they are appropriately associated with the celebration of the dark. In the old days, Halloween meant big bonfires, which draw mosquitoes and moths, which would in turn draw bats. So bats were likely a common sight during the early festivals and celebrations. Those rational explanations aside, bats are sort of creepy, and certain groups thought that the little flying rodents were able to communicate with the dead. In the number six spot are black cats. Ancient Celtic religions thought that cats were reincarnated souls of humans, and that they were able to see the future. It was also thought that witches could turn into cats. We're not quite sure what the color of the cat has to do with Halloween, but those black cats have always had a bad rep. Despite what people think, I think they're still cute. We're almost there. Coming in at number five are skeletons. Halloween was believed to be the night where the line was blurred between the living and the dead. Skeletons are an off-scene Halloween symbol for that reason. The skull, in particular, is a symbol used by many different cultures to represent either the brevity of human mortality, the fear of death, or danger that can result in death. In the number four spot this week are ghosts. 
Since the May not only celebrated the end of the harvest, but also those that have passed into the next realm, it is called by some a festival of the dead. The idea of ghosts plays into this idea that Halloween night is the one night that the spirits of the ancestors are able to walk along among the living. Plus, they're spooky, or Scooby-Doo when you need him. Taking the number three spot this week are costumes and masks. Back in Celtic times, celebrators of Semaine would wear costumes in order to trick the roaming spirits of the dead. It was thought that if you could trick the spirit, the spirit would refrain from bothering you. On a night that the veil between the spirit world and the natural world was so thin, it's best to pretend to be someone else. However, the commercialized side of Halloween costumes did not become popular until the 1950s with the introduction of trick-or-treating. And the trend stuck. If someone handed you free candy, you'd keep coming back too. The number two spot this week goes to jack-o'-lanterns. Remember those early trick-or-treaters we talked about in the beginning? Well, when they were doing their souling, they would carry hollowed out turnips with candles in them to light their way. Eventually, the preferred vegetable changed to pumpkins and the tradition of jack-o'-lanterns became what it is today. People stopped carrying pumpkins to light their way and began carving scary faces on them and setting them on the porch, not only to light the beggar's way, but to scare away evil spirits. And finally, drum roll please, the number one spot goes to witches. On Halloween night, witches were believed to be at their most powerful. It was also thought that witches were in cohorts with the devil, which meant burnings, dunkings, and hangings for those who were thought to practice witchcraft. Nothing was scarier to the Celts than a witch riding her broom across a full moon. This is probably why it's the most common Halloween symbol today. No wonder it's the most preferred costume for little girls. Well, sadly, all those things must all good things must come to an end, including Halloween. With the costumes, candy, and fun things to do, it is easy to see why Halloween turns out to be a favorite holiday for most. And with symbols like jack-o'-lanterns, flat cats, and ghosts, Halloween is always extra spooky. That's it for this week. I'm Jamie Stalford, and make sure to join us again next week for another edition of The List. Thanks, Jamie. Hannah, are there any special symbols that r make Halloween really stand out for you? Uh, carving pumpkins. That's always been sort of a family tradition. We carve pumpkins on Halloween night. What about you? Uh, gotta be ghosts. We hang up ghosts everywhere in my house. <laughs> now don't go away. This rip -roaring edition of The Morning Show will continue right after this break. But before we go, we have our trivia question of the day. Today's show is all about Halloween, and so is our trivia question. We all know Halloween is a time for kids to go trick-or-treating as they try to stock up on candy. Our trivia question today asks, how many children aged 5 to 14 will go trick-or-treating in the United States this Halloween? A, 29 million, B, 41 million, C, 66 million, or D, 102 million? We'll have the answer when we return. Visit StopBullying.gov. Welcome back to The Morning Show. This Friday is Halloween and it's the theme of our show. Halloween parties continue to grow in popularity with adults, but we all know the evening belongs to kids. Today, our trivia question asks, how many children aged 5 to 14 will go trick-or-treating in the United States this Halloween? A, 29 million, B, 41 million, C, 66 million, or D, 102 million? And the correct answer is B, an estimated 41 million children ages 5 to 14 will go trick-or-treating across the United States. And those children will have plenty of options. There are 115 million potential stops for trick-or-treaters this year. Now that is a lot of candy. More candy is bought on October 28th than any other day of the year. While people are out buying all that candy, keep in mind that 50% of kids prefer chocolate candy, 24% prefer, prefer non-chocolate candy, and 10% prefer 
prefer gum. While the other 16% will take whatever is being handed out. They have no preference. With all this candy on the brain, it's a perfect time to introduce our next segment. People of all ages should pay close attention. Young viewers may learn something new, while adults will receive good reminders on safety. We have a list of Halloween health and safety compiled by the CDC. Following these simple tips can help this Halloween fun and safe, be fun and safe for everyone. Everyone wants to have a safe and happy Halloween for themselves, their guests, and especially their children. Using safety tips and some common sense can help you make the most of your Halloween season and keep it as enjoyable for your kids as it is for you. There are lots of simple ways to help keep your child safe on Halloween when accidents and injuries are more likely to occur. The excitement of children and adults at this time of year can sometimes make them not as careful as they would normally be. To help you stay safe, here are 13 tips to remember while you're out trick-or-treating this Halloween. Just keep the words Safe Halloween in mind and the important tip that comes with each letter. S. Swords, knives, and similar costume accessories should be short, soft, and flexible. A. Avoid trick-or-treating alone, walk in groups or with a trusted adult. F. Fasten reflective tape to costumes and bags to help drivers see you. E. Examine all treats for choking hazards and tampering before eating them. Limit the amount of treats you eat. H. Hold a flashlight while trick-or-treating to help you see others and to help others see you. A. Always walk and don't run from house to house. L. Look both ways before crossing the street. Use established crosswalks whenever possible. L. Lower your risk for serious eye injury by not wearing decorative contact lenses. O. Only walk on sidewalks wherever possible or on the far edge of the road facing traffic to stay safe. W. Wear well-fitting masks, costumes, and shoes to avoid blocked vision, trips, and falls. E. Eat only factory-wrapped treats. Avoid eating homemade treats made by strangers. E. Enter homes only if you're with a trusted adult. Only visit well-lit houses. Do not stop at dark houses. Never accept rides from strangers. N. Never walk near lit candles or luminaries. Be sure to wear flame-resistant costumes. By keeping Halloween a fun, safe, and happy holiday for you and your kids, you'll look forward to many happy years of good memories. So remember to have fun, stay safe, and be smart. And happy Halloween! While Halloween is a fun holiday, please be sure to be safe. One unfortunate fact about Halloween is that children are more than twice as likely to be killed in a pedestrian to car accident on Halloween than any other night. So please be careful and use proper safety precautions. We hope these tips helped you, but if you need a reminder or would like more Halloween safety, then visit the website www.halloween-safety.com. There you will find safety information on many different topics, such as costumes, driving on Halloween, and trick-or-treating. All right, it's time now for this week's lunch menu. This is the menu for Monday, October 27th through Monday, November 3rd. On Monday, October 27th, sit down for a wonderful meal of either chicken parmesan or corn puppies. Side items include sweet potato waffle fries, a garden salad, and applesauce. Then, on Tuesday, October 28th, you won't want to miss out on lunch as your cafeteria will be serving chicken nuggets with roll or fish, fishy tuna salad sandwich. While you're in the lunch line, don't forget glazed carrots, garden salad, and fresh fruit. On Wednesday, October 29th, have a fantastically good time at lunch and enjoy chicken and waffles 
or a Salisbury steak with a biscuit. Finish the meal off with a red skin mashed potatoes with gravy, a garden salad, and diced pears. On Thursday, October 30th, battle your midday hunger with enjoying either cheesy breadstick bites or chicken fajita with Spanish rice. Also on the menu are great northern beans and a garden salad and fresh fruit. Then on Friday, October 31st, awaken your taste buds with flavor-packed popcorn chicken with a roll or a drool-inducing meatball hoagie. On your way to the table, be sure to pick up macaroni and cheese, carrot sticks, garden salad, and diced peaches. Finally, on Monday, November 3rd, fill your belly with cheesy chicken soup with a roll and crackers or energize yourself with a beef taco with Spanish rice. Complete your awesome meal with tasty barbecue pinto beans, garden salad, and a frozen fruit cup. And there you have the lunch menu for the week. Don't forget, you can also start your day off with a healthy and hearty breakfast at school. Shifting gears now, archaeologists study past human life and culture through the recovery and examination of remaining material evidence. Using artifacts, inscriptions, monuments, and other remains, they paint a picture of the past. In many cases, that, that picture tells a story. We have one of these amazing stories from our friends at the Archaeology Channel. This week, they take us to Egypt and the Tomb of the Mummies. Tomb robbing has been a problem in Egypt since the days of the first pharaohs. It became so rampant long ago that the priests gathered up the mummies and grave goods from many royal tombs and hid them away in a secret cave. 3,000 years later, a young boy chanced upon the tomb. His family looted the site for 10 years before his astounding discovery came to light. When archaeologists finally arrived on the scene, they were stunned by what they saw. Tomb robbery is one of Egypt's oldest professions. Even in ancient times, tombs were plundered for their valuable objects, and whenever they could catch them, the authorities brought the robbers to justice. Almost the same thing happened nearly 3,000 years later in Deir el Bahri, near the famous Valley of the Kings. There, in 1871, a young man called Ahmed el Rashul from the village of Kurna accidentally discovered a hidden tomb in the belly of a mountain near his home. He spread the news to his family and soon the whole village had a new occupation. Stealing from the long dead. became tomb robbers and stealing their only source of living. They began trading their finds with dealers from Luxor and Cairo who were always eager for new antiquities to sell to European tourists and collectors. Soon, many of the objects from the treasures of Deir el-Bahri started to appear in the West. They included beautifully illustrated funerary papyri and royal shapti, all in perfect condition. The Egyptian authorities started to suspect that something was going on and decided to launch an investigation. After 10 years of looting, the pressure of the authorities on Ahmed El Rasul's brother forced him to confess, and he took them to the path that led to the hidden tomb. When archaeologist Emil Brusch finally arrived to investigate the long-lost tomb, he was stunned by what he saw. We came upon cases of porcelain funerary offerings, and when we reached the turn of the passage, a cluster of mummy cases came into view. Collecting my senses, I made the best examination of them I could by the light of my lamp, 
and at once saw they contained royal mummies. And yet that was not all. I came to the end chamber, and there, standing against the walls, or lying on the floor, I found even a greater number of mummy cases of stupendous size and weight. It felt as if I was looking into the faces of my own ancestors. The tomb didn't just contain a couple of mummies. The discovery was huge. There were more than 50 kings, queens and other royal bodies in this one place. One of the biggest surprises was that the mummies were from different dynastic periods. Among them, were Ahmos Meritamun from the 17th dynasty, Tutmos III from the 18th, and Seti I from the 19th. What had happened? Why had a single tomb yielded the mummies of so many kings and queens? After careful investigation, the answer came to Brush. This was an ancient hiding place for the Egyptian royal dead. Priests had moved the mummies from one tomb to the other to protect them from ancient tomb robbers. Most of the knowledge we have of ancient Egypt comes from ancient tombs. Archaeologists are struggling to save these messages from the past and to keep up with the looters and unscrupulous dealers. That way, the mummies can continue to rest in peace, whilst helping us to understand more about where we came from and how our civilization began. Another interesting story from the Archaeology Channel and a perfect one for our Halloween edition of The Morning Show. And now it's time to add a little music to your morning. Moonlit Sonata is one of Beethoven's most popular compositions for the piano. Unlike the formal sonata, form of the classical period, Moonlight Sonata is more of a free-form classical musical piece. Beethoven composed the famous Moonlight Sonata in 1801 and dedicated it to Countess Giulietta Gucciardi, a pupil of his. Shortly after their first few lessons, the two fell in love. After dedicating the Moonlight Sonata, it, believed, it is believed that Beethoven proposed to her, but one of her parents prevented the marriage. The popular title of Moonlight Sonata didn't come about until several years after Beethoven's death in 1836. A German music critic wrote that the sonata reminded him of the reflected moonlight off Lake Lucierne. Since then, Moonlight Sonata has remained the official, unofficial title of the sonata. Here is this morning's great moment in music. Sherry Pearson, you are the sole surviving heir of the King of Montanopolis, and you are now worth $45 million. I'm rich! This can't be real! Of course it's not real. Come on. 
Having money isn't about luck. Like that takeout meal. Cook at home instead, you can save thousands a year. Feed me. Feed the pig. Welcome back to The Morning Show. I'm Dylan Grace. The Buzz is our entertainment report covering books, movies, music, and video games. This week, EJ prepares us for Halloween by sharing his top three family-friendly movies to watch on Halloween. Welcome to The Buzz. My name is EJ McGonigal. Halloween is right around the corner, and nothing can make the evening more exciting than a good, and perhaps somewhat scary movie. To help you decide what to watch, this week I'm reviewing the top three family Halloween movies. The 1984 comedy Ghostbusters starts my list off at the number three spot. It stars Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, Harold Ramis, and Ernie Hudson as the Ghostbusters, a group of paranormal investigators based in Manhattan. After being laid off, the group of quasi-scientists find an old firehouse to set up as their place of business, capturing and imprisoning ghosts. As time goes on, business picks up and weird things start to happen in the apartment of Dana Barrett, played by Sigourney Weaver. Soon, the Ghostbusters find themselves up against a god from another dimension. Ghostbusters is a fantastic Halloween movie for the family. The comedy is great, which is to be expected with a cast list like this one, and you will find yourself enjoying all of the different ghosts and ghouls shown throughout this movie. Fair warning though, if you are watching this with your kids, they might find some of the scenes a little scary, but nothing is too horrifying for a family to enjoy together. For parents, this movie will bring back memories from the mid-80s when this movie came out for the first time and was talked about and loved by people of all ages. It has become a classic over the past 24 years. Speaking of classics, our next Halloween movie is It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. This animated movie from 1966 features the famous Peanuts gang. Charlie Brown heads to a Halloween party with his friends when Linus decides to sit out on trick-or-treating that night so he can wait in the pumpkin patch for the Great Pumpkin. This mysterious and large pumpkin is said to visit the pumpkin patches on Halloween. Unfortunately though, things don't turn out very well. Charlie Brown returns home with a trick-or-treat bag full of rocks and Linus goes home without ever seeing the Great Pumpkin. It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown is an adorable movie. Kids will absolutely love it, and parents will remember watching it on TV when they were their kid's age. The show uses child-appropriate humor and has a very relevant moral at the end. This half-hour telecast is broadcasted every Halloween on TV. So this October 31st, get your kids together, gather around the TV with some pumpkin pie, and watch this charming classic. Finally, we have the number one family Halloween movie, Hotel Transylvania. With voice work from Adam Sandler, Andy Samberg, Selena Gomez and Kevin James, this animated flick is a great watch for the whole family. It's about a lovely hotel for monsters, and monsters only, run by none other than Count Dracula himself. The unconventional guests use the hotel as a reprieve from the human world, a place where they can be themselves and not have to worry about terrifying people. However, while the guests are enjoying the celebration of Dracula's daughter's 118th birthday, a regular everyday guy stumbles upon the hotel and chaos ensues. This movie is great for the family. The kids will love all of the giddiness and use of all of the famous Halloween monsters, and parents will laugh at the cute humor and clever premise that this movie has to offer. It's a movie that celebrates differences and everyone, make that every monster, gets along. Hotel Transylvania is perfect to watch with your little ones on All Hallows Eve. Halloween is a time for spooks and specters, but it's also a time for families to spend time together. After trick-or-treating, pile onto the couch and pop some popcorn while you enjoy these entertaining and family fun movies. I'm E.J. McGonigal, and thanks for tuning into The Buzz. Happy Halloween! Thanks, EJ. Those are great movies. I'll have to plan on watching all three this weekend. Yes, those are really quite enjoyable movies. It's time now for your school news on The Morning Show. Let's send it back over to our news anchor, Jada Zugel. Thank you, Dylan and Hannah, and welcome everyone to your school news here on The Morning Show. Blair Elementary School boldly went halfway around the world to a small village in India via Skype 
During the month of September, the Bulldogs of Gregory have been collecting books for a girls' school in India. The reward for the class that collected the most books was a chance to talk with students at the school. To prepare the, the Blair students wrote questions, learned a special song, and a few words of the Indian language. The event brought the cultures together to share their likes and dislikes. We learned their favorite games and how they, um, they played and how, what their favorite sports were and what they ate. We donated over 150 books to India um, to give them books so they can read and learn new things. Blair Elementary collected over 900 books to donate to the school in India. Students will get a chance to follow the books to their final destination. The cargo container the books will travel in contains a GPS travel. Students will monitor the progress of the unit as it crosses the Atlantic, making its way to the Indian school. Skype is opening some amazing doors of opportunity for young people. It is allowing students around the world to interact visually. They can see, share, and explore together their cultures, hobbies, and lifestyles like never before. Blair students are just beginning to reach out beyond their campus to a greater world beyond, a world where they can donate books and then see the joy in the faces of those receiving the gift on the other side of the globe. Stop, think, act, reflect. These words stand a powerful actions in the program at Freeman Elementary called the STAR Strategy, or just STAR for short. It is a simple concept that helps children by teaching them to make better choices that they don't always know how to handle in social situations. Last week, teachers at Freeman introduced to the stop, think, act, reflect concepts to their students to help reinforce the important message of the program, students make, made posters to put up in the room as a reminder of the acronym. STAR helps student, children internalize how they can help each other. The strategy offers a number of easy ways to teach students skills through hand-on activities. The program has proven to help students internalize concepts better than having guest speakers visit or holding theme-based assemblies. Teachers have found the strategy an excellent to help students develop their self-knowledge and relationship skills while resolving conflicts peacefully. Finally, 17 elementary school singers from New Hanover County Schools have been selected to participate in the 2014 North Carolina Elementary Honors Course sponsored by the North Carolina Music Educators Association. We get this report from YSN reporter Heather Jensen. The North Carolina Elementary Honors Chorus is a group of approximately 200 students who are chosen from across North Carolina to perform at the North Carolina Music Educators Association Conference each year. The purpose of this honors chorus is to provide students with the opportunity to develop their abilities to the greatest possible extent. Teachers who are members of Music Education Association are permitted to send in auditions from six of their students. Judges are hired to select the members of the honors chorus. Teachers then work with their students in preparation for the concert and students spend the day before the concert working with the conductor. Participating in the North Carolina Elementary Honors Chorus this year from Bellamy, Aliyah Marshall and Elena Giver. Their teacher is Emily Propst. From Blair, Kathleen Mounts, her music teacher is Amanda Henson. From Coddington, Avery Limley, Molly Shute, Ella Shinette, and James Watson were chosen for honors course. Coddington's music teacher is Mary Tyndall. From College Park, student Victoria Roblera Mendoza was selected, and her music teacher is Carrie Aviolis. Going to honors course from Eaton are Jennifer Kenta and Molly Wells. Their music teacher is Carly Kanzler. Five students from Kali Tree were selected for honors course. They are Milia Del Savio, Alexa La Cognata, Samantha Lenz, and Ella Pfeiffer. Suzanne Gardner is the music teacher. Ogden has two students, Riley Moore and Georgia Smith, selected for the course. Lem Stemke is Ogden's music teacher. Finally, from Pine Valley, Bailey Hughes is part of the honors course and Pine Valley's music teacher is Vicki Stump. Selected via a vigorous recorded audition, 
The 200 voice chorus singers will present a concert at the NCMEA Annual Professional Development Conference in Winston-Salem on November 9th. The guest conductor will be Tom T. Shelton, Jr., Assistant Professor of Sacred Music at Westminster Choir College in Princeton, New Jersey. Reporting for your, your school news, this is Heather Jensen. That's all for now. To watch this week's edition of Your School News online, visit the school system's website at www.nhcs.net and click on the NHCS TV logo on the homepage. Now back over to Dylan and Hannah. Thanks, Jada. Now to end today's show, we have our popular morning show Halloween game, Catch the Candy. That's right. We are rejoined by Jada, who will tell us all the rules and how Dylan and I can win some tasty candy. That is right. I have candy which you can win if you are successful in our, in our game, Catch the Candy. Now listen closely to the rules. You each get a free 10 seconds to toss a piece of candy in our Halloween pumpkin. Every piece you make in, you get to keep. The catch is you, only, you can only use one piece of candy at a time. If you miss the basket, you have to get the candy, run back to the line, and toss again. To help each, each of you out, I'm going to give you a chance to earn more time. Before we toss candy, you will each get a chance to answer five questions. For each correct answer, I will give you 10 more seconds. We will start with the questions. Are you ready? Okay, Dylan, we are going to start with you. Here goes. Okay, so the first question is, chocolate candy bars are the most popular treat on Halloween. Can you name the number one candy bar? A, Snickers, B, Dove, C, Kit Kat, D, Hershey's. Is it D, Hershey's? No, it's A, Snickers. Whoa. <laughs> okay, so number two. From, the, from what country did jack o lanterns originate? A, Scotland, B, Germany, C, England, or D, Ireland? Um, can you repeat A and B? Scotland, Germany. Okay, uh, A, Scotland. No, it's D, Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the third question. The American tradition of carving pumpkins was first recorded in which year? A, 19, I mean 1755, B, 1837, C, 1946, or D, 2021? All right, I'm going to say that it's not 2021. I'm going to say that it's B. 1837, that's correct. Yes. What a guess. Okay, <laughs> number four. In what year was the movie Halloween filmed? A, 1837. B, 1962, C, 1978, or D, 1985? C? 1978, that's correct. Yes. Okay. Next question. What year was Frankenstein written by Mary Shelley published? A, 1801, B, 1818, C, 1856, or D, 1905? D, 1905? No, it's B, 1818. Dang it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't okay. Know. How old was Mary Shelley when she wrote Frankenstein? A, 19, B, 26, C, 35, or D, 55? A, 19? Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> okay, next question. So this is a true or false question. So true or false, October 30th is the National Candy Corn Day. False. No, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Why do we have a National Candy Corn Day? <laughs> um, okay, so the next one's also truth or dare. I mean, true or false. <laughs> so true or false, Harry Houdini, the famous magician, died on Halloween. Uh, false. No, that's true. <laughs> A weird I have no coincidence. Idea. <laughs> okay. So, how many pounds is the world's largest pumpkin grown on record? A. 1,515. B. 1,798. C. 1,952. Or D. 2,009. Is it A? 
No, it's D, 2009. <laughs> Who grows a pumpkin that big? <laughs> yeah. Who needs a pumpkin that big? <laughs> and finally, a question everyone always wants to know the answer to. On average, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? <laughs> I know Pop? this because I tested it. A, oh, two. No. B, 101. C, 252. Or D, 576. Um, 2, 101, 252, 576. I was going to say D. No, it's C, 252. It's nowhere near the number I got. <laughs> All right, good job, guys. Here are your totals. Remember that you both started with a free 10 seconds. Dylan, for your correct answers, you earn a total time of 20 seconds. And Hannah, you earned a total 30 seconds for your correct answers. We're going to take a short break to, pre to prepare for the toss. We'll be right back. Side. So often you see negative purposes for needles, but a needle is the key element in sewing. It's what makes the garment beautiful. You see a lot of drug abuse just walking down the street. It makes me really just look for something else to do, to stay as far away from that as possible. You get a high from doing something positive that lasts. For me, it's sewing and my fashion show and people wearing my clothes. That's my high. Welcome back to The Morning Show. Before the break, our two hosts answered questions to earn time for a candy toss. Now they can get to try and score some candy. Let's go over the rules once more. You have to toss a piece of candy in our Halloween basket. Every piece you make in, you get to keep. Remember, the catch is you can only use one piece of candy at a time. If you miss the basket, you have to get the candy, run back to the line, and toss again. Dylan, you get to go first. You earn 20 seconds. I have the timer set. Are you ready? Get set, go. Dang it. I'm not gonna get a single one. <laughs> 15 seconds. 20 seconds is up. That was seriously 20 seconds? Yeah. <laughs> because they're <laughs> Okay, 30 seconds. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, you can go whenever. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> 20. Alright, great job to both our contestants. Hopefully next time you will get more candy in the bucket. Hannah, enjoy your candy. Well, that does it for this edition of The Morning Show. Remember, for the best TV of all, each and every day, keep it turned, tuned right here for New Hanover County Schools TV on the Learning Network of the Cape Fear. Have a great day.